These are mistakes that everybody makes with their nutrition. There are mistakes that people make that are very nuanced and very advanced and very complex. And then there's just mistakes that everybody makes. I make them, you make them, my wife makes them. It's just simple. Let's just jump right into the first one. Not having adequate time between meals. I've talked about this probably at nauseum. I've said it so much, but it is important. We used to think that constantly grazing would be a great way to lose weight, and it might be a great way to lose weight for some people. But when you're talking about fat loss, we do need to factor in that when we have breaks from food, insulin levels come down and glucagon goes up. Glucagon going up increases lipolysis. So it increases the contribution of fat as fuel. So yes, if you take two groups of people that are eating the same amount of food, same amount of calories, they might lose the same amount of weight, but perhaps the person that has adequate time between meals, they might utilize more fat and keep more lean body mass. So what I recommend is, I don't care if it's two hours, four hours, six hours, 18 hours, just have clear defined gaps and don't graze so you actually give yourself a chance to tap into that glucagon benefit. Number two is one that I am very guilty of myself and that's not paying attention to energy flux or G flux, also known as energy turnover. We hear way too much that we should eat less and move more. There's all these people on the internet that actually attack people that have nuance online because they say, oh, it just comes down to calories in, calories out. It's that simple. It is that simple, but that also really confuses people because if you tell people to just eat less and move more, they're gonna drive their metabolism into the ground. There is something called energy turnover. And that means that the more you eat, the more calories you actually burn. If you eat 2,000 calories per day and I eat 4,000 calories per day, and you burn 2,000 and I burn 4,000, you would think we're net neutral, but we're not. I'm actually burning more by eating more and moving more. That is the goal, to be able to eat more and move more, but still put yourself in a deficit that way. So calories in, calories out still matters, but the way that we're portraying it online is only confusing people more, and it's a huge nutrition mistake. Your goal should be eat a little bit more or even a lot more and move a little bit more or a lot more. As a matter of fact, it's important to take little rotations. So what I recommend you do is have periods of time where you eat more and move more. Then have periods of time where you eat less and move more. Then maybe have periods of time where you eat less and move less. Kind of rotate yourself through these things, but don't just eat less, move more. Number three is super important. And again, it gets lost in the simple equations. Micronutrient density is important. And if we neglect them, we will fail. There was even a study published in Nutrition that I can take for example, that looked at like vitamin D. Found that vitamin D has an effect on uh, SIRT2 and 1, NAD SIRT1, which has a direct impact at a genetic level with how an adipocyte, a fat cell, holds fat. So vitamin D decreased the amount of fat that a fat cell could hold in it, by default making a fat cell smaller and also increasing lipolysis. And then just to kind of take as another example, if you're deficient in magnesium because you're not getting foods that have magnesium, guess what? Magnesium is an activator of vitamin D. It's required for the synthesis and activation of vitamin D. So you're deficient in magnesium, guess what? No vitamin D, no fat benefit there, right? And then we have like things like zinc, right? Zinc not only is good for inflammation, but it's also very, very important when it comes down to leptin regulation. So you're deficient in zinc, you have a crazy appetite. My point is, is yes, your greens do matter. Yes, the organ meats do matter. Yes, the quality of your food does matter. And unfortunately, eat less, move more is taking the importance out of this. Those calories still matter, but the density of your food matters too. Number four is not getting enough fiber. And I know I just sound so cliche and boring, but we forget that fiber A satiates us, that's important, but probably even more important, contributes to the diversity of our microbiome, which directly affects how our cells burn fat and oxidize fuel. So if we have a weak, very narrow gut microbiome, there is countless literature that demonstrates that we have a poorer metabolism. So yes, you should focus on fiber. It's a very important piece, and you shouldn't be scared of the carbs that come from fiber. It's a big nutrition mistake. Number five is one that's gonna make some enemies here. That's eating too much fat. I have news for you. Eating fat does not make you burn fat. It does not work that way. If you eat 100 grams of carbohydrates and 100 grams of fat, 
they are certainly going to have different effects in the body. And there might be a body composition change that's to your advantage one way or the other. But the reason that the carbohydrates and the fat might have different effects is more so because the carbs are impacting insulin more than anything else. That could be advantageous, it could be a disadvantage for you. What I'm saying is, molecularly speaking, fats store very easy as fat. Carbs still can store as fat, but it's a multi-step process. And if I ate 100 calories of fat and 100 calories of carbs, and I was already in a surplus, the 100 calories of fat would store slightly faster than the 100 calories of carbs. Equal calories, it's just how they store. Once you reach the amount of dietary fat that you need, anything else immediately stores as fat because that's the storage mechanism. Carbohydrates can store as liver glycogen, as muscle glycogen, or be burned. Then they go through de novo lipogenesis and turn to fat. So one of the first things you might want to consider doing to reduce calories and lose some fat is actually slightly turn down your fat intake. Which leads me into the next one. Huge mistake, probably one of the biggest mistakes, plant-based, animal-based or not, is not getting enough protein. Okay, not only is protein playing a critical role in maintaining our lean body mass, but it has such a tremendous thermic effect. Like it literally turns to heat. 20 to 35% of the calories that come from protein simply turn to heat. But what do we do? We fill ourselves up with a bunch of empty calories or we fill ourselves up with even nutritious calories from carbs, from fat, things like that. But we're missing the most important pinnacle of what we need as humans, which is protein. Whether, again, it's plant-based or animal-based, I don't care. Now, personally, I like steak. I put a link down below if you wanna try some good grass-fed, grass-finished beef from ButcherBox. Talk about them all the time. That is a really tremendous source. Their ribeyes are like literally the most succulent, best tasting ribeyes that I've had in a long, long time. Their fillets are super tender. My wife and I are both big fillet people, but they don't just have steaks. They have a bunch of other stuff. They have scallops, they have seafood options, they have chicken, they have pork, they have sausage, they have bacon, they have breakfast sausage. It's unreal and it gets delivered right to your doorstep. So that link down below gets you a special discount. Plus they're still running their promo for free ground beef for life if you wanna check them out. So that link down below in the description for ButcherBox Definitely recommend. Also, you can get the specific cuts that I get and check out my custom boxes as well. So check that link out. The next one upsets people, but it gets taken out of context. You need to earn your carbohydrates. What does that mean? Carbohydrates are fuel, okay? You have to burn them. If you have carbs and you're eating too much of them, you're going to store them. It's that simple. Now, that doesn't mean that they store super easily. The point is, is that they should be used as energy. So if you're going to be active, eat carbs. Treat them simply as fuel. You wouldn't add a bunch of gasoline to your tank when you know you're just sitting there forever. But you might add more gas if you're gonna be driving, right? That's the way we need to think of carbs. Next up is going to be meal timing. Now, I know this sounds like a very advanced mistake, but I'm gonna make it as simple as I possibly can for you. Almost all of our cells have a light-dark cycle. They understand what time of day it is. So if we eat at the wrong time, it actually fundamentally distorts things. So there was even a study published in Obesity where they had subjects consume 700 calories for breakfast and 200 calories at night, or 200 calories for breakfast and 700 calories at night. The group that had 700 calories at night, guess what? Higher levels of insulin resistance. So do this over the short term and it's a problem. Over the long term, it can lead to complete metabolic disruption. Why are we not talking about this more? Probably because it flies in the face of basic energy balance, but you can use it with energy balance. If you take this data and you say, oh, all that matters is if I eat more calories in the morning and calories no longer matter, you're gonna fail. But again, it's like this multi-component system. It's a jigsaw puzzle. Perhaps calories in, calories out is a big giant piece that we need to focus on, but what about these other little pieces that also make up a big chunk of this, right? We have to look at the big picture, and it's really a huge detriment if we do not. So what does this look like? I have a simple trick for you. Eat a larger breakfast, a smaller lunch, and an even smaller dinner. And the last one that is super, super important but gets thrown into the bus and is very underrated is eating probiotic-rich foods. Okay, you're gonna turn off this video because you've heard it. Let me explain why. Things like kefir, things like fermented, even onions, fermented garlic, even yogurt, cottage cheese, all these fermented foods, 
they have been staples in our life as long as we can see in the history books because it's how we preserved food. So maybe it's part of our evolutionary growth, right? Maybe it's part of why our gut does so well when we have these in the equation. And the research is very clear, especially with kefir and dairy-based probiotics. What does it do? Well, obviously contributes to our gut microbiome, which changes how we oxidize fuel, how we burn carbs, it improves our glycemic response, it improves our mental health, it improves our digestion, and very, very importantly, it modulates inflammation. There is so much we need to learn about the gut microbiome, and it is a big, big nutrition mistake, as small as it might sound to you, to ignore these fermented foods. So take that to account and add them into your diet today. I'll see you tomorrow.